Hello. Good morning, everybody. My name is Nicholas Moyer. I'm the uh, CEO of the Canadian Council for International Cooperation. I want to welcome you all, welcome you all to join us this morning. Um, we're going to be talking this morning about women and girls in humanitarian emergencies, a critical topic, and we're going to be unpacking that in many ways this morning. I'm really glad that you're all here with us. Je veux commencer aussi avec quelques mots en français pour vous accueillir, vous dire la bienvenue, accueillir aussi les centaines qui, nous, qui se joignent à nous en ligne, um, en plus de ceux qui sont ici présents dans la salle. Je veux vous signaler particulièrement que uh, cette session se fera en anglais. Pour ceux d'entre vous qui voudraient avoir des casques d'écoute, il y a une traduction simultanée. Vous pouvez voir Lindsay qui est en arrière si vous n'avez pas vos casques. Um, I will repeat that in English. Um, this session will mostly be in English, but obviously this is Canada and we absolutely are happy to express ourselves in French and English. For those of you who would like to uh, access the simultaneous translation, there are headsets available uh, by Lindsay in the back if you haven't uh, had access to that yet. So before I go any further, I think it's important for me to recognize that we are all on unceded Algonquin territory. I think it's something that always we must remember um, when we join together and talk about the issues that matter to us. We're talking about uh, humanitarian assistance this morning. We're talking about women and girls in humanitarian emergencies. The fact is that the world has never had so much capacity to respond to international disasters around the world, and yet we can do so, so much better. And so that's really what we're talking about today. And we have some esteemed um, colleagues that will be uh, elaborating on this topic uh, with us. So we'll be hearing this morning uh, from uh, Mark Lowcock, who is um, here to my left and is the Under Secretary General and Humanitarian Relief Coordinator for the UN's Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. It's a very long title, <laughs> um, but it's an important title. And actually, the, one of the ways that I sort of think about this position is uh, Mr. Lokok gets to sit in the middle of all things humanitarian in the multilateral system. And so uh, his perspective is particularly unique and valuable to us. He certainly does come with a long career in our field and is um, most recent role prior to this was as um, permanent secretary to the Department of for International uh, Development in the UK. And so you'll hear his accent is British. Um, and that is very much welcome here. Um, <laughs> we are obviously also joined by um, the Honorable uh, Minister Marie-Claude Bibot, who um, has been a champion for um, feminist issues in, inter in international development in Canada and we'll be sharing some of her remarks as well uh, with respect to this topic. And to round out perspectives from the multilateral system and, and uh, the federal system in Canada is a civil society voice. And so Julie Delahanty is the executive director of um, Oxfam Canada. She's a, a well-renowned uh, feminist and leader in the international development sector in Canada. And so we're privileged to have her and all three of you here this morning. Um, I want to say just a few brief words. This event is co-hosted by uh, the Humanitarian Response Network and uh, Global Affairs Canada. The Humanitarian Response Network is a, an amazing uh, community of practice in Canada of humanitarians that come together to share their experiences, their best practices, their learnings. Um, and it's a group that actually is 20 years old this year. And I was just reflecting on that. It's quite amazing all that has been done um, in those 20 years. And it's a group that works very closely with Global Affairs Canada particularly in the Humanitarian Affairs Unit, as they share notes on disasters that are happening around the world, about issues that matter uh, to all of us, enshrining humanitarian principles in the work that we do. And so I think that that relationship is what allows this event also to happen. And I really want to signal the great work that's been done um, making this event possible. Um, in fact, I was, I was um, reminded that even just last week, the, uh, the Humanitarian Response Network went, met together and talked specifically about um, sexual and reproductive health rights and emergencies, talked about um, uh, also menstrual health management in emergencies as well. And so they're sort of segueing already into some of the topics that we'll be covering. Now, you're not here to hear from me. Um, I will be happy to uh, moderate the panel that will follow. I want you to know that we asked for many questions beforehand, and so we have prepared those to moderate the panel after um, our in initial allocutions. Um, and then you will then have a chance to mingle with the members of the panel afterwards that are going to stick around for, uh, for a half hour or so after as well. So uh, with no further ado, um, I'd like to hand over the podium and microphone to uh, the Honourable Minister Bibo.
So over to you. Bonjour à tous. Merci Nicolas. Et merci à la Coalition humanitaire d'avoir organisé, organisé cette discussion ce matin. Le leadership de notre société civile canadienne est vraiment remarquable. Mesdames et messieurs, nous, avons, nous sommes vraiment chanceux aujourd'hui de pouvoir accueillir Mark Wilcock, secrétaire général adjoint des Nations unies aux affaires humanitaires et coordonnateur des secours d'urgence. Mark's visit to Canada is extremely timely. Timely because Canada is, of course, seized by the humanitarian emergencies currently unfolding in many parts of the world. But also timely because we believe that Canada and OCHA must continue to work together to build a more gender responsive global humanitarian system. For a long time now, we have known that women and girls are too often the most affected by crisis and the primary targets of conflicts. And yet, our humanitarian responses often fail to take their specific needs into account. Take sexual and reproductive services, for example. According to UNFPA, between 25 and 50 percent of maternal deaths in refugee settings are due to complication of unsafe abortions. Humanitarian principles compel us to respond without discrimination to the needs of people affected by disaster and crisis, and to make sure that the most vulnerable have access to life-saving assistance. But humanitarian assistance cannot only be about saving lives. It must be about answering all basic needs. And in the case of protracted crisis, it has to be about transforming lives. I don't think we can uphold humanitarian principles if we don't uphold the principle of gender equality. Although we know that women and girls are powerful agents of change, their voices and leadership are still undervalued. That is why we were very deliberate that our feminist international assistance policy also covers Canada's humanitarian assistance. Not only because a gender transformative approach to humanitarian assistance ensures a better response to the needs of women and girls, but also because it strengthens our entire response. We are actually working on a specific policy on gender responsive humanitarian action that will underpin and further develop the commitments made in our feminist policy. And we look forward to sharing this new policy very soon. All humanitarian actors need to take a hard look at their programming and policies and ask themselves the questions, Do our investments and programming choices really match our stated intentions? Can we do better? Can we push the boundaries? For the Government of Canada, our commitment to a more gender-responsive humanitarian system means that we will continuously advocate with our partners to adopt a gender-responsive approach, impose stronger criteria for partners to receive Canadian funding, humanitarian funding, systematically support initiatives that target the specific needs of all women and girls and build our capacity as agents of change. And also support evidence gathering to combat impunity and work with like-minded partners to ensure we uphold the account, we hold to account those who use sexual violence as a weapon of war. Consider this. While in 2015, half of our project had no gender consideration, since the launch of our feminist international assistance policy, I have approved only one gender-blind humanitarian project. It was in support of logistics. <laughs> Canada's advocacy and acute focus on gender equality and sexual and reproductive health and rights in emergency settings is delivering results. For example, Canada funded a three-year initiative with UN Women in Cox's Bazar to create a gender hub. This hub increases the capacity for gender-responsive humanitarian action by helping local and international organizations and partners build gender equality into their operations in support of Rohingya refugees. Canada was also the first donor to support UNFPA's efforts to establish two women-friendly spaces in Cox's Bazar 
that provide critical information and services to women and girls. Through our policy focus, that number has grown to 20 women-friendly spaces. And through our, our advocacy and leadership, other donors have decided to expand that number for a total of 39 to date. Last June, Canada advocated for collective commitments as part of the G7 Whistler Declaration on Gender Equality and the Empowerment of Women and Girls in Humanitarian Action. Now, that commitment has, be, has to be followed by concrete implementation. We will be sharing the lessons learned at the upcoming Women Deliver Conference in Vancouver in June. Indeed, much remains to be done, and we are fortunate to have the opportunity to reflect on this today with Mark Lokok. With over 30 years of humanitarian and development experience with the UN, and as the Permanent Secretary of the United Kingdom's Departmental for International Development, Mark brings an important perspective on the very serious humanitarian situations facing the world today. But he also knows how and what is required for the international humanitarian system to adapt and evolve. Mark, this is why your leadership as Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Response Coordinator is so important. You can signal the international system's willingness to change for the benefit of everyone affected by crisis. Please welcome Mr. Mark Loka. Thank you very much indeed. A few days after starting this job in September 2017, I went to Difa in Niger on the border with Nigeria, a place to which huge numbers of people, most of them women and girls, had fled from the Boko Haram terrorists who were wreaking havoc in their homelands. I met a woman called Aichatu and her four young children. They were living under a plastic sheet. Aichatu was terrified of violence, especially fearful that she and her daughters might be abducted by armed men roaming over the border. To protect them, she took her children into the bush every night, risking disease and snake bites. A few weeks later, I was in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh, listening to the stories of women who'd fled the violence of the Myanmar authorities in Rakhine. Stories of being forced to watch as their husbands, fathers and sons were killed and then being themselves subject to the most extreme forms of rape and sexual violence. A few months later, I met Monga Albertine and her children in a camp near the shores of Lake Tanganyika in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Her husband had been killed in tribal fighting and she fled to try to save her children. She was trying to survive under a plastic sheet on a wet, slippery hillside with not enough to eat, no school for the children, and no way of making a living. And two months after that, I met a woman called Fatima in another camp in South Kordofan in Sudan. She described to me the risks she took every day gathering firewood in an area where women are frequently assaulted and raped. Most people caught up in humanitarian crises around the world are just like this. The majority are women and girls, although there are many men and boys too. Most of them are caught up in conflict, and the thing that makes it hardest to help them is how the men with guns and bombs behave in those conflicts. The world's humanitarian agencies do a good job in saving lives and reducing suffering among people caught up in conflict, but we do not do a good enough job for women and girls. In my dozens of visits to countries caught up in crisis, the stories of women and girls have stuck with me more than any others. Stories of escape from violence and terror, stories of barbaric acts committed against them, stories of fear for their children and loved ones, but stories also of hope and resilience. Women and girls are defiant. Mothers determined to ensure that their children were safe and had the chance to go to school young girls with ambitions to be doctors, engineers, and leaders, heads of households who had resolved to take control of their lives, start businesses, 
and provide again for their families. Brave survivors, not just helpless victims. So today, I want to talk about how the complexity of humanitarian crises in the 21st century disproportionately affects women and girls. And I then want to highlight ways in which we can do better for them. First, to ensure that women and girls are better protected in humanitarian crises. In particular, how can we protect them from violence, including sexual violence and conflict? Second, doing a better job to ensure women and girls get the specific support they want and need, like reproductive health services, and also like trauma recovery and counselling support for those who are survivors of violence. Third, doing better to ensure women and girls are empowered to thrive and given access to opportunities to get an education and become self-sufficient. And fourth, ensuring women's needs, skills and capacities are better understood and represented, and represented at all levels of the humanitarian system. The problems we're dealing with have at their origin power imbalances, including in the humanitarian system itself. More women at the top would help. I am particularly pleased to be addressing these issues here in Canada. Canada understands that a global humanitarian system that better responds to the needs of women and girls is simply a better humanitarian system. In so many ways, you are the trailblazers on this issue, and you should be recognized and applauded for it. Prime Minister Trudeau himself famously proclaimed himself a proud feminist in 2015, and since then, he and his government have walked the walk. By launching Canada's first feminist international assistance program, Minister Marie-Claude Bibeau has set a standard that many others around the world should seek to emulate. Canada's commitment to ensure that at least 95% of your bilateral international development assistance integrates or targets gender equality is an excellent demonstration of your leadership on this issue. And Canada is also rallying the rest of the world to this cause. The G7 Whistler Declaration, your leadership on the call to action, the hosting of the Women Deliver Conference in June, all speak to your global prominence on improving the lives of women and girls. I also want to say that it was the only Canadian who has served in my role, Carolyn McCaskey, who was also the first woman to do the job, who supervised the first gender strategy produced by my office. I'm also very pleased to be talking today at the Global Centre for Pluralism. The message of strength through diversity is so important in today's fragmented world. So why do we need a specific focus on women and girls? Over the last decade, there's been an unprecedented growth in humanitarian need across the world. In 2018, the UN provided life-saving help to more than 100 million people caught up in crisis. And we raised a record 15 billion US dollars to do so. This explosion in need is largely driven by conflict. 21st century conflicts are more intense, violent, and protracted than they were 30 years ago. Often, non-state armed groups splinter into multiple factions with weak command and control. Fighters from both states and non-state groups show scant regard for international humanitarian law. These characteristics of modern conflict have specific consequences for women and girls. The Yazidi women, the Chibok girls, the Rohingya refugees. Their stories rightly caught the world's attention. The barbarity and cruelty that they experience shocked us all. My colleague Pr Pramila Patton, for example, who's the UN Special Representative on Sexual Violence in Conflict, coming back from Cox's Bazaar in November 2017, recounted horrific descriptions from Rohingya women and girls of the brutality they suffered. In addition to rape, forced public nudity, and sexual slavery and military captivity, many reported being tied to rocks or trees before being gang raped by multiple soldiers. It was a concrete example of sexual violence being used as a deliberate tool of dehumanization. There's a clear statistical correlation between physical security of women and the levels of conflict in a country. Something like one in five displaced women who are asked say they've experienced sexual violence. 
rape is increasingly being used as a weapon of war and terrorism. Girls are, kidnapped, are victims of kidnap and forced marriage. As my colleague Virginia Gamber, who's the UN Special Representative on Children in Armed Conflict, has pointed out, girls as well as boys are among the children recruited into armed forces, just as they're traded, sold, trafficked, or exploited as sex slaves in the brothels of war. Globally interconnected terrorist groups use young girls as human bombs, strapping explosives to their bodies and forcing them to walk into crowds of civilians before detonating the bomb. In crises, women and girls often cannot get access to vital basic health services. Every day, more than 500 women and girls die from pregnancy and childbirth complications in crisis-affected countries. And inadequate help with menstrual hygiene is keeping girls in tents and shelters, preventing them from accessing services and limiting their mobility. Girls in conflict zones are more than twice as likely as boys to be out of school. The central role that women often play in caring for their families can also contribute to their added vulnerability. So take the current Ebola outbreak in DRC, twice as many women as men have been effect infected because it's women, many of them heads of households, who are in charge of caring for the sick, bringing them to the hospital and preparing bodies for burial. Let me be clear that we are making strides in the right direction with all of these challenges, but let me be equally blunt far more needs to be done. Doing more to strengthen our support to women and girls in humanitarian crises is in everyone's interest. It's going to help men and boys as well as women and girls. So the first area I want to highlight is how we can do better at protecting women and girls in crises. At a minimum, we should be making sure that camps are well lit, putting locks on toilets and showers and setting up safe spaces for women and girls. When I visited Cox's Bazaar, I met Rohingya refugee women who'd regained hope through safe spaces and counseling services provided by the UN Population Fund and UN Women after su suffering those sickening levels of violence. And as my inspiring colleague, Natalia Karnem of UNFPA told me, the women she meets are clear that the greatest wound is the one the doctor cannot see. That's why I welcome the second summit on mental health to be hosted by the Netherlands in October, with its focus on mental health and psychosocial support in emergencies. Improving protection means that everyone needs to take responsibility for it. For example, women and girls are at greater risk of violence at food distribution points, or if they have to travel long distances to a water point. There's clear evidence that as food security increases, levels of domestic violence also go up. This means that protecting women and girls is the concern not just of a small minority of gender specialists. The camp manager, the local mayor, the food distribution contractor all have to think about how their particular activities can be adapted to better protect women. Pamzili Mlambogunguka of UN Women rightly reminds us that changing the behavior of men is as important as protecting women and girls. Violence against women is preventable. It is not an inevitable byproduct of war. There are clear examples of how the right kind of action makes a difference. A project funded by the UK's Department for International Development in the Democratic Republic of Congo supported faith leaders to work in their communities to address violence against women. This successfully reduced domestic violence from 69% to 29%, and sexual violence was down from 21% to 4%. If we want more success stories, we need to invest in protection. Only 3 to 4% of all humanitarian spending goes to protection activities. Even less, around one half of 1% is spent on gender-based violence. That needs to change. I will play my part in addressing this. 
From the Central Emergency Response Fund, which my office runs and to which Canada is an important contributor, we have for the first time asked the UN's resident and humanitarian coordinators, who are the people who have access to the fund, to prioritize activities that support women and girls. But most of the choices on what to fund in humanitarian crises are made by the donors. So there is more that they, including Canada, can do to ensure that our rhetorical commitment to protecting women and girls is backed by financial decisions. With Ina Eriksson Sereda, the Norwegian Foreign Minister, I'll be organizing an international conference on tackling gender-based violence in humanitarian crises in Oslo in May. We will make new commitments there, so please watch this space. We must also do better at protecting women and girls from sexual exploitation and abuse by people working for humanitarian agencies. The work we do is dependent on trust. When aid workers commit the terrible crime of sexual exploitation and abuse of the people we are supposed to serve, it is the most deplorable abuse of that trust. The United Nations has zero tolerance for sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment. We're addressing this challenge across the whole of our system. We need a determined, enthusiastic, energetic and long-term commitment to really get to the roots of the problem. We are making it much harder for perpetrators to move from one organization to another. We are strengthening our investigatory capacity. We've also created a fund, which I'm financing from my office, to pay for investigations when allegations arise. We've adopted new and better mechanisms to report abuse, to investigate complaints, to enforce disciplinary proceedings, and to provide assistance to victims and survivors. And all our staff do mandatory prevention training. We must be vigilant and ensure that every day we're applying our policies on the ground. The second area where I think we can do better is to ensure that the global humanitarian system provides women and girls with what they actually want and need. There are a range of key services that women and girls rely on in any humanitarian crisis. For example, we know that they need reproductive health care, including access to family planning, prenatal, maternal and newborn care and nutritional support. After the massive earthquake that struck Palu in Sulawesi in Indonesia last October, it became clear that there were up to 40,000 pregnant women in the affected area. The first concern of many of them was who, following the destruction of hospitals and clinics, would, would, would look after them and help them have their babies safely. We provided money from the Central Emergency Response Fund for just that. And when some days after the earthquake, the UN Secretary General and I visited Palu, we saw the work that UNFPA were doing on exactly that topic. We need to take a no regrets approach. Before we've even conducted a needs assessment in a new or changing crisis, we should roll out the minimum initial service package for reproductive health. To make sure we understand the needs, we should rapidly deploy gender and protection experts from the very beginning of any crisis to shape the overall response. This brings me on to the third area where I think we can do better. Helping women and girls not just survive a crisis, but actually to thrive. Specifically, this means getting access for girls to education. It means women being helped to become self-sufficient, and women being given a voice and empowered to take control of their lives. By now, everyone knows that educating girls is one of the best investments on this planet. As Bill and Melinda Gates said in the letter they issued last month on the work of their foundation, educated girls are healthier, they are wealthier, and their families benefit too. The more education a woman has, the better equipped she is to raise healthy children. But as I said earlier, in the midst of a conflict, girls are more than twice as likely as boys to be out of school. We are making strides in dealing with this. Since it was launched in 2016, Education Cannot Wait, which is the fund to get children in crises back to school, has reached 364,000 girls. As Gordon Brown, who chairs the fund, has said, putting girls in school is the most effective way to keep them free from exploitation, forced labor, trafficking, and child marriage. Another key vehicle for empowering women in crises is to give them the tools to attain self-sufficiency and support their families through cash transfers, credit lines, and livelihood support. 
there's a direct link between women's economic security and their physical safety. UNICEF projects in Jordan and Lebanon, for example, are providing girls and women with skills which are enabling them to get jobs so that they can earn an income. Cash is, provide, is proving a real game changer for women in humanitarian settings. The International Rescue Committee's research into their humanitarian cash programs in Jordan showed that women receiving cash feel strong, confident, respected, independent, and able to negotiate. Throughout the world, women continue to play a vital role in crisis response. In almost every crisis, local women are the first to respond and the last to leave. Women convene assistance networks, they coordinate responses, they provide psychosocial support, they raise funding, they spread awareness, they lay the foundations for conflict resolution, and they mobilize for peace. A recent study on women's roles in the Yemen crisis gave a sense of their multiple roles. There, women are mobilizing aid, they're administering first aid to the wounded, they're running checkpoints, and they're engaging in conflict resolution on both sides. In every humanitarian crisis, we need mechanisms that allow for two-way communication and engagement to ensure that the voices of women and girls are heard and that the planning and implementation of the response takes into account their needs. For example, following Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines in 2013, women played a central role in the recovery and reconstruction process. With the help of Canadian funding, women were able to ensure that assistance to women was prioritized and that women were included in decision-making. The fourth area where we need to make more progress is to increase the number of women working in senior levels in aid agencies. This is important because, and I will quote your prime minister here, it's 2019. <laughs> My boss, Antonio Guterres, has identified this issue as one of his personal priorities, as the unfinished business of our time. Not only is achieving gender parity the right thing to do, it's also important because it will improve outcomes for women and girls in humanitarian crises. When women are appointed at decision-making levels, results play out on the ground. For the first time this year, we've reached the point, uh, last year, sorry, we've reached the point where half of the top jobs in the UN are held by women. When I took up my post, there were two men for every woman heading up Ocha's country offices. Now we are close to parity. At the end of 2017, 30% of the posts in Ocha at P5, which is the first senior management grade or above, were held by women, 30%. At the end of 2018, it was 42%. It will continue to rise. In October 2017, visiting Pulka, the small town in Borno in northeast Nigeria, which the Boko Haram insurgents for a brief period captured and made their capital, I met a young woman working for the International Organization for Migration. She'd grown up in Borno. She'd previously been a teacher. But when conflict broke out, she wanted to play her part to relieve the suffering of her people. So she became an aid worker. She was committed and knowledgeable, and she had clear leadership skills, and she'd been promoted into management position, one of too few women in such a role, but an example we need much more of. Another important way of achieving progress on this issue is to try to remove the obstacles that have been preventing women from reaching senior positions in humanitarian organizations. These include HR policies that address maternity leave, health, well-being, and aggressively fight all forms of harassment in the workplace. Now, I'm conscious that some of the things I've talked about will strike some people as nerdy or techy or processy, and that's true. But my experience over many years in big bureaucracies, and, and thank you for pointing out quite how many years, <laughs> my experience is that worthy initiatives often die between concept and implementation. Particularly in the sector I've worked in, intellectually spirited people have been good at describing the problems we face and proposing conceptual frameworks to address them, 
and then moving on to some other problem before making sure things are really changing. We don't want that to happen on these issues. That means focusing in a determined, detailed, and durable way on things that may appear nerdy, but experienced bureaucrats know will actually make a difference. Another one of those things is data. We do not have enough information detailing the specific needs of women and girls versus men and boys in humanitarian crises. And as Bill and Melinda Gates again said in their letter last week, data can be sexist. Inadequate data is a key barrier to designing, implementing, and monitoring humanitarian action that can benefit women and girls. Each year, my office produces the Global Humanitarian Overview, the world's most sophisticated, authoritative, and comprehensive assessment of humanitarian needs and response. This year, we are going to improve the coverage on women and girls. But this is another area where the donors can help. For example, by investing more in data gathering and in response programs in which it's a requirement that the issues affecting women and girls are properly identified. So in conclusion, we have seen that there's a lot that we in the humanitarian sector can do to respond and to empower women and girls. To secure wider change, we'll need political players and institutions across development, peace and security, and international justice systems to continue to push for results, as well as women's groups, advocates, national and international NGOs. We will need more money too. Importantly, men and boys must be part of the solution and they too stand to benefit from its outcomes. Studies show that when laws and policies are backed by powerful grassroots action, critical social change can occur. These dynamics have been part of the key to the success of the global Me Too movement, which is starting to shift deeply entrenched power imbalances across the world. This critical mass can take years to build, so we must be determined and persistent. In the words of the Nobel Prize winner Wangari Mathai, no matter how dark the cloud, there is always a thin silver lining. And that's what we must look for. The silver lining will come, if not to us, then to the next generation or the generation after that. And maybe with that generation, the lining will no longer be so thin. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> I was meant to stay there, but I think this is nice. Thank you. Thank you. So, well, thank you very much, Mr. Lowcock, for so aptly describing some of the challenges that we have in the, in the humanitarian com uh, community and some of the possible solutions. And thanks also to Minister Bibo and the government and the bureaucrats who work so hard and are so committed to this issue and these issues. And we're really looking forward to the humanitarian uh, policy. So thank you for letting us know that that's coming. Uh, Mark, you included so many powerful examples, uh, especially from conflict settings, which, which isn't surprising given that uh, conflict's driving 80% of humanitarian need in the world. And I'm going to try and um, pick up on a few of the many issues that, that Mark uh, raised, just, just a couple, I won't be long. Uh, first, I think it's really important to remember that uh, humanitarian uh, or conflicts and crises that happen radically affect the social and the cultural and the political structures, uh, and they can create um, opportunities to renegotiate gender power relations. And on one hand, that can create a lot of um, risks for women, and, for, uh, and, and it can also exacerbate some of the inequalities, so things like gender-based violence or domestic violence or unequal access to services. But the collapse of a political and social uh, order can also sort of paradoxically create a lot of opportunities for change. So for example, uh, women may be more prominent in, in uh, peace negotiations or in mediation, or men may have to take on greater care responsibilities when they're unable to work. 
So if gender equality is prioritized during and after a conflict, and if, if our work connects strongly to uh, the gender equality efforts that are already underway in countries, largely through women's rights organizations that are already working in those countries, then it may be possible for us to consolidate uh, some of the positive changes and the gender norms uh, and power relations that exist. But if, on the other hand, we treat, uh, we treat gender equality as an afterthought, then uh, long-standing patterns of inequality are very likely to return or actually to get worse in some of the cases that we've seen. You also mentioned in your talk uh, the importance of empowerment and finding out uh, what women and girls actually need and want. And this is an area that clearly we have to do a lot better in. Uh, as Mark noted, there is a lack of meaningful consultation of, of women and beneficiaries. And I'm talking here about very basic consultation. So when it comes to things like cash programming that we've often talked about and talk about it as the, the benefits to women, uh, we have to ask whether that cash is conditional and what kind of conditions. And often donors are putting conditions on that kind of cash. So women have to decide whether they're, you know, they have to, they're, they're told they need to spend this on food for their children or on education or an immunization or whatever it is. And that's not an empowering feeling for the women who are receiving that, that cash. Uh, and they may not even want cash. We have, to be, uh, we have to be asking them what kind of modality they want their assistance to be in. They may prefer food. And if they prefer food, what kind of food do we want? We often don't even ask them such basic questions as what kind of food is the best for them. You also talked about uh, abuse within our own sector and the many and very important activities that the UN, Oxfam, and many NGOs, most NGOs in this room, are very actively working on. And that work requires uh, more resources, more work. It needs to be expanded. But I, just a little caution, I feel sometimes that we focus so much on zero tolerance, on ensuring that we have the right policies and procedures in place, which is very important, but that we sometimes don't step back and think about the gender equality aspects of that sexual exploitation and abuse and the kind of power dynamics that are existing within our own organizations and how we're really addressing those power dynamics. And we say that often, we, the term is used a lot, that we're victim-centered, uh, but we, we haven't really reflected on what that really means, especially in terms of things like investigations. Finally, when we talk about uh, building local capacity to respond to humanitarian crises, we need to do that in a way that's really driven by the leadership of women's rights actors in, in the communities. Otherwise, there's a risk that the localization process will be driven by local actors, whether they're government, whether they're private sector or religious entities, that hold very deeply gender discriminatory views and practices. We need to work with, uh, with, NG with women's rights organizations as part of our agenda, but we also need to recognize and respect that women's rights organizations who are there before, during, and after a crisis, think very differently about crises. They work across a spectrum of development, humanitarian assistance, and peace. And we have to meet them where they are, not ask them to deliver services for us or do the things that we want. We really need to be working with where women's rights organizations are at within their own communities. And one last point, if I can, on data. Uh, that was mentioned. It's very important to have data, uh, but we also need the learning and evidence about what works, and we really need to share that amongst people. And we have to be very careful about being extractive. Uh, we study and we collect data from communities all the time. We ask them endless questions, but we almost never go back to those communities and tell them what we learned. What are we doing with that data? How is it being used? And often, of course, in the case of gender-based violence or sexual and reproductive health and rights, we actually don't need data to be able to respond right away. In short, I think that we can be very bold in our aspirations as humanitarians, and I think we have been with the Canadian government. We can be bold, though, and very bold by following the lead of women's rights organizations around the world who are at the forefront of the response. And those women's rights organizations don't stop challenging and transforming on gender equality just because there's a humanitarian crisis, and neither should we.
Thank you, Julie. Um, you know, I think uh, to pick up a word you used, uh, Mark, I think it's time to be me <laughs> because we need to talk about all of the implications of addressing um, gender properly in our responses to emergencies. And so, you know, as we get into that, I, I, I will ask, Minister, did you have any reactions to what we've heard? We're going to have a lot of questions to come, but there may have been some, <laughs> some thoughts that came up for you. Well, uh, I must say that I was touched by it actually the introduction. And um, I think we are all motivated by the same thing. When we go in the field and we meet with women and girls, this is this gives us all the the reasons and the motivation and the conviction and the and the strength to to come back and fight for them and improve our systems and and move forward. So that I was I was very touched by all the uh, and even um, it reminds us reminds me many you know uh, of my discussions i've mm -hmm. had in the field yeah. and uh, this is why we're here right. it's for them mm -hmm. very true um i'm struck with by the um the fact that um you have chosen to come to canada to give uh this speech um mark and i'm, I'm struck also by the symbolism of that the signals that you're giving because Fundamentally, gender responsive humanitarian assistance is beyond the policies that we have in place. We have many of those mm -hmm. in our system um, that have been developed at a range of levels, and yet it seems that systemic change has remained out of reach in a variety of ways. And so really from, from the good practices theory to the good practices in reality, those systemic change will, changes will require some significant commitments. And so I'd really like to hear perhaps from you you know, to get us started about what you think it is that we need to do to ensure that we can succeed to change a system that is influenced by, as Julie reminded us, and as we've heard in, in many of your allocutions, that this is not just about the policies, it's also about the deeper power dynamics that exist within the system that we have. Right, so um, there's, there's a couple of levels to that. There's firstly how the humanitarian system behaves, and then there's the environment in which it operates. So in terms of um, how the humanitarian ecosystem or system, whatever you want to call it, you know, my job is to, and the UN pays my salary, but my job actually is to be the coordinator for the whole of the humanitarian system, the Red Cross and the NGOs and the whole system. And it's a $23 billion a year system, of which $15 billion is raised through the UN. There's basically three things, I think, that make the biggest difference to systemic um, change. The first thing is leadership. Leaders do set direction and convey a vision and a message. And I mean, as you said, anybody who has the experience you and I have, going and listening to the stories of people whose lives are horrifically trashed, it's not that difficult to work out what we need to do. But leaders then, as you've been doing, need to convey and be determined and persistent in, you know, saying what needs to be different. The second thing that really matters is money. You know, the um, humanitarian system, as I said earlier, has been very, very good at saving lives. Very cheaply, by the way. You know, it costs us just 30 cents a day to... Um, keep a starving child alive in Yemen. But the system has been very focused on that life-saving mandate, and we need to broaden it out to do, deal with other elements of suffering. And that is going to happen if the people who finance the system, which is, is, is only voluntarily financed, whether it's Oxfam, through your supporters, or whether it's the UN through member states, or whatever it is, the, the money is all voluntarily provided. It's not like other elements of what we do in the UN, the peacekeeping, for example, where the budget's assessed and member states have no choice but to pay for it. Um, so the people who provide the money actually have quite a big say on what gets financed. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing is around incentives. Um, you know, um, one of the things I've learned in life is people respond to incentives. Bureaucracies especially <laughs> respond to incentives. I'm not, I, I, I think the problem is not the policies and guidance we have. 
frankly, we do, we do not need more policies and guidance in most of our organizations. Some of us have too much of that, so much that it's impossible to read it all. What, what you need is an incentive framework where people think that the people who they are accountable to or have to worry about the opinion of are watching what they're doing. And you know, if we make progress on those three dimensions, we will move the system further forward. In a way, the more intractable issue is the nature of, of the situation in the context we're working. And um, that is going to be, a, to Wangari Matai's point, that's going to be a much longer term agenda to get more equality between women and men in, in a lot of the contexts in which we're working. But one of the powerful contributions we make is by the way we ourselves behave in those contexts. You referenced a, a quote from Antonio Gutierrez saying that this was the unfinished business of our time. And I'm, I'm interested to know perhaps reflections from, from others as well. What have we done? What is working well? You know, but where do we really need to be focusing? Um, our efforts. So I don't know if perhaps, uh, Julie, you want to give a first stab at that? Um, well, in terms of, I think so much has, has changed, in fact, and I think in a way the biggest thing that's changed is, is that 10 years ago, even five years ago, I don't think we would even be having this conversation about gender equality. Uh, 10 years ago in the humanitarian system, we talked about the needs of women and girls. We didn't really talk about equality of women and girls. And I think what we're doing better in large part is around, um, it is around actually doing those assessments, having better, we have really good tools. We often don't implement them enough, but we do have quite a lot that we're doing and that we could be doing more of. And there's, there is more of that in the system than, than there was before. You do need to have gender advisors and gender analysis and power analysis and all those things have to happen. And I think we've gotten much, much better at some of those things. Uh, there are so many challenges, though, to, to doing all of those things, whether it's the kind of funding, either we have short-term funding or, or, um, or not enough funding, or we have... Uh, uh, there's no opportunities for standalone gender equality programming in humanitarian assistance, or it's diff more difficult to, to receive. Uh, we have, um, again, tools, just lots of tools, but implementation, 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 we're not often getting to those. Uh, yeah, but I think it's also the context is really changing, and we have to be really aware of what the challenges and opportunities are within the context that's changing. And uh, in the Sulawesi response recently, uh, there was an interesting thing, those of you who work in that area, there were, it was very difficult to get visas for expatriates to go in to work on that response. And the result of that was in part that some of the negative things were not having expatriates who have all that training and have that capacity to do that work is a, is a problem when you, you have the whole UN system kind of unable to really get in there and do stuff, people who go in and do that normally. But at the same time, for Oxfam, we were able, as a result, and we might not have done it as quickly if we hadn't had that particular issue, we brought women's rights organization into the response. And as a result, because that organization knew so well the context, we were able to integrate gender equality considerations into the program much, much quicker than we probably would have if we had brought in all those advisors. So I think it's really thinking through what's changing in, in the context that we're working in and what are the challenges and opportunities that exist in that context. It's true. Well, I think we've been good at saving lives, but you know, going forward with answering the needs and, and filling the gaps specifically for women and girls, uh, obviously this is something, and it's interesting, just what you just said reminded me that you know this feminist international assistance policy came after a very serious consultation with all of you in 65 countries and when I was back in the field meeting with you with your partners with our partners and uh, you were thanking me for this feminist international uh, assistance policy uh, for pushing you to do so and I said how could you say that you're the one who were pushing me to have you know to be very bold on on answering the needs of women and girls and empowering women and girls. 
And so I realized that it's one thing to talk about it and even to know and to have the data and to, you know, I'll, we all agree that this is the right thing to do. But there is more to do in the field and really changing the way we do things in the field and don't look at women and girls only as beneficiaries or victims, but really as agents of change and, and, and take the time to consult with them, to bring them around the decision uh, table and to find better ways to involve them in the implementation so they can build their capacity, develop their leadership and, and really be empowered. So, um, and it's not limited to gender specialists. Everyone, and I think Mark, in, in, you said that everyone has to, to be part of it to, to, and, and to include men and boys in, in as well. You know, that visionary leadership is essential. I think we, we're at a place where we need to have those echoes and those, um, those visions stated for us so that we can uh, rally around the changes that we need to make because they are so broad and systemic and culture-wide. culture, culture -wide. Um, You know, we have big ambitions, perhaps in, in around gender equality, but when it comes to humanitarian programs, we also have timelines and we have needs and we have short-term needs and we need to be ensuring that people are able to maintain their dignity, um, that we can live by the humanitarian principles that ensure that we are needs-based. Um, how can we really be ambitious around a transformative gender agenda in what are very short-term projects um, in humanitarian response? One of the characteristics of most of the crises we're dealing with is they they last a long time. Um, you know, the for our appeals as the UN, on average, we've been appealing for seven years. And one of the things we need to do is recognize, particularly in crises which have their origin in conflict, which is most of them, unfortunately, this is less true of um, sudden onset disasters in better off countries. But, but for the bulk of what we're doing, it'd be much smarter to recognize from the outset, you're probably going to be dealing with this problem for a while. And to be recognizing from the outset, be a good idea to think about what you're doing in a way which contributes to solutions for people, as well as saving their lives in the short term. And that's where all of the things around empowerment, especially for women and girls, and giving people a chance to um, have a bit more agency and control over their own destiny become so important. Julie talked about um, cash programming. Um, you know, cash is, has a transformational potential, actually, in humanitarian settings. Um, and, you know, the use of cash, giving people money to solve their own problems, um, which has been growing a lot in development humanitarian over the last 10 years, it's one of the most heavily monitored, evaluated, scrutinized, reviewed, audited, you know, studied things in the whole sector. Because people were rightly worried that, you know, what, what will people do if you give them money? Um, and, 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 and we've learned something important by having this massive review study exercise. And the thing we've learned is if you give people money, typically they do three things. They buy food, they send their kids to school, and they try and find some way of making a living. And whether you set conditions on the money you give them or not makes no difference, typically, to what people choose to do. So I think there is a big opportunity to expand the use of cash so people can solve their own problems. And <clears throat> we do recognize in the UN that we have a bit of a responsibility to help with that. Because <coughs> one of the other things we've seen in the use of cash has been there's been quite a bit of competition between agencies to be in a principal role in cash programming. And so in December, um, the head of the World Food Programme, David Beasley, and the head of UNICEF, Henrietta Four, and the head of the UN Refugee Agency, Philippa Grandi and I, published a joint statement committing ourselves to move towards a single system to deal with the competition problem, a single system for cash in humanitarian settings, which has multiple benefits. For example, the benefit that 
if you've got a single system, you're less likely to have multiple agencies supporting the same family and other families not being supported by anybody. You'll, you'll have a much more efficient, um, cheaper to run system if there's only one of it rather than every agency having set up its own platform. Um, and we're very keen to progress this proposition. We've got six pilot countries that we're working on and it's open to everybody. So we're talking to the Red Cross about how they would like to be engaged in this and NGOs as well. So I've given a long answer to your question, but, but um, those are the kinds of things I think we need to think about and do. So agency in good part. I mean, that's one of the big lessons that comes from cash program. If we can let go of some of the hierarchy and the decisions that we have to make, that we have historically made for people affected by crises, there's a lot of potential there for transformative change. Julie, you want to say? Well, just to build on that too, um, there's lots of, we have, we had a, in Indonesia, we had a cash for work program. And one of the things that we did was provide uh, for displaced women who were caring for family members, we provided them with cash for work, which really forced thinking in the community about the value of, of what is normally unpaid care work. So trying to shift and transform ideas within communities through through different modalities, I think, is, is another method of kind of pushing the issue. But also, I think, um, connecting, um, connecting our development and our humanitarian programming and thinking more in terms of how we, how we make those links between the two, I think, is another part of, of ensuring a kind of transformation. Because we can see, I, remi uh, I remember, I think, in Jordan, I mean, just, uh, I'm not even sure. But I mean, th this type of, of support also contribute to the stability in the region because they will go and buy locally and it will just grow the economy and it contributes to the good cohabitation between uh, the newcomers, let's say, or the refugees and the host community. So it, and when we think about it, we do that in Canada, for example, with the Canada Child Benefit. I mean, we give money to the most vulnerable families uh, in, in our country. And we're not uh, asking what they are going to do with that. We know that it's going to go for the, you know, the best of, uh, of their kids. And, and it, grow, it grows the economy. So it's, <laughs> I mean, it, <laughs> it's the same basic uh, logic. We want to support those who need our support and, and it will contribute to the best uh, of their community. Right, we should take the best practice regardless of where it is. Mm -hmm. um, sexual and reproductive health rights have uh, historically been significantly underfunded. You know, um, the humanitarian space is no exception. Um, and so, I wonder if uh, you know, while some progress has been made, there, there's still a lot more that needs to be done. I wonder if Minister Bibo, you'd speak a little bit to what Canada has done uh, to support sexual and reproductive health rights. Um, and in emergency settings. This is something that we realized really soon uh, when we started the consultation that there was a big, big gap. Uh, and uh, we've, dis we've committed $650 million to uh, Six hundred and fifty million dollars. Great, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, <laughs> good. Uh, because we already had the maternal and newborn health initiative that was great, but that was not enough. We really have to support the full range of sexual and uh, reproductive uh, services. So that, that this is an important thing. And when I was uh, visiting refugee camps, for example, and visiting all these clinics, I, I could understand you know, the importance of it and, and having this conversation and seeing that so many women and adults and girls arrive pregnant in camps after you know, uh, going across the country. And and it's it's everything related to uh, hum, hum, uh, our human based uh, human right based approach. <laughs> uh, so this is um, th this is why it, it is also so important. And I remember also when I was there, because I had an experience in development. You know, working in development with poor people is one thing, but when you arrive in humanitarian context and crisis affected countries, it's completely different uh, story and uh, meeting and re recognizing and seeing all the effects of violence. So yes, we have to provide these uh, health services and to defend the rights, 
but uh, we also have to provide the psychosocial assistance around gender-based violence. And this is also something that has to be included in our support regarding sexual and, and uh, reproductive health uh, services as well. That's, that's definitely true. It, it also speaks to the fact that we now need to provide a lot more services in humanitarian response too. And I think it's also a big learning that the system has made around acknowledging that it's not just about absolute basic life-saving needs, that there are many other things that compose you know, a, a dignified response uh, to humanitarian disasters. Um, Julie, what would, what would be some examples that you could share of sort of comprehensive programming that focus not, focus, focuses not just on protection, health-based SGBV response, but also addresses the full spectrum of SRHR needs? Um. Just to start, when Mark was talking about all of the great accomplishments of the Canadian government in this area, he didn't say that one, which I think is one of the most important, which was the, the 68.7 million that went to sexual and reproductive health and rights in humanitarian settings specifically, and how important that money is because there's not enough. And I don't think that there is any one program that I could point to. There is, as Mark mentioned, the, the minimum, uh, minimum standards, the uh, minimum initial service package, the MISP. And that package includes the, the obvious things, the um, addressing and preventing sexual violence, ensuring contraceptives, uh, prevention of HIV AIDS, uh, newborn and maternal health. Uh, but it's also a package that sort of deals with how the planning is going to happen for those programs and ensures that across a humanitarian response, you have all ag any agencies working on it are working together in a coordinated way and that you have that kind of a, a bottom line for a comprehensive package that's then moving up. So I think doing that understanding, making sure that that's happening, but also again, making sure that there is a gender advisor as part of the work that's being done, that you are working with women's rights organizations, so that you understand the specific needs that are happening within the community, whether that's what's the most appropriate menstrual products for women to be using, or whether there's laws and policies, uh, for example, that prevent women from accessing uh, abortion services in communities. So all of those, those issues also, I think, need to be, need to be thought through. Um, we, we know that there's an opportunity to contribute to women's empowerment through the programs that we deliver. Um, and uh, Mark, you spoke to the role of education in that um, in humanitarian settings. And I, I wonder if you could share perhaps some top of mind best practice in humanitarian programming from donor countries. Perhaps some of that is from Canada, but we're also interested in what there might be from elsewhere that you might be able to share with respect to programming that does support uh, women's empowerment. Yeah, well, I mean, I talked about some of the examples of cash programming, and I, I think, um, I think, you know, the pennies dropped in most financing organizations, most of the donors that um, having a stronger focus on protection, but also on education services is really important. I mean, obviously, Canada, the minister mentioned earlier, um, um, that the, the program um, that you're doing in Bangladesh. And, and I do think, Mary claude that the, that experiment you're running, people are going to need to follow that carefully. And as we discussed last night, when I go back to Cox's Bazaar um, in April, I'd be really keen to see how that's going and do what I can to sort of spread the lessons. One of the things about lessons is sometimes you learn things are going well, and sometimes you learn things that could be even better. And having one of the things I like about your project is I think it has an intent to be open about both categories of things because that's how learning happens. And then the good things get replicated, um, hopefully. The other really, really important thing, and this is, I think probably it was in the Syria crisis that we all got to this um, um, earlier, but it has been replicated for the Rohingya, is just to recognize that um, these conflict-related crises do drag on. And so thinking about that from the outset is one of the reasons you have to think about education. What do we think those Rohingya boys and girls in 10 years' time are going to be like if they don't get an education? What are our successors going to say about us if we don't think with the government of Bangladesh about that problem? And, you know, in the Syria crisis, this is where education cannot wait came from. And um, 
my former boss, Gordon Brown, who's the champion of it, I think he was right on the money to have a strong focus on that when it became clear that we were in for a protracted problem in 2011, 2012 in, in um, Syria. And there has been progress made, but I do think there's a lot more that needs to be done. There is, and there's so much that we could continue to talk about. I, I think we could unpack um, many of these elements that we have long-term work to do in this regard. We have some leaders here on the panel that are helping drive that system towards um, better better progress that serves women and girls around the world. Um, we unfortunately don't have time to can unpack all things, but I do wonder if uh, you might want to sort of end this panel with a few final thoughts, things that we haven't covered that really are uh, front of mind for you. Um, perhaps I see Julie nodding, so I might start with her and then- She's always nodding. <laughs> um, no, I just, I think when it comes to working with women's rights organizations on the ground, just how important that is to do that and to to follow general, you know, it, it, it it's this protracted nature. These aren't going away. Uh, organizations are there on the ground. We need to meet them where they are and work work together with them. And I think that's that's the message. And listening to women, asking them, asking them what they want. I think those would be my two big messages. <laughs> I'll have to find others because <laughs> it was the exact same Collective, thing. Uh, we have to we we have to work more with local women. So for choosing other, I will say um, working on gender-based violence and uh, ending impunity as well. Maybe we haven't had the time to talk a lot about it, but it's so important to gather and uh, evidence and, and to so because we have to give justice to these women. And if we want to end it, uh, there must be consequences to that type of, of behavior. So this is also something that we have to pay attention to and, I mean, act for. Certainly. I think that's a great point, by the way. I mean, we're living in an age of impunity, unfortunately. And we need to do something to turn that around. And one of the things we do to turn it around is to gather the evidence mm -hmm and witness testimony when a bad thing happens, even if you're not sure straight away you can enforce accountability. Sometimes later, it turns out you can. I worked in Bosnia in the early 1990s when those atrocities were committed and we were all tearing our hair out about whether there would ever be any justice. And it turned out a long time later, Mr. Milosevic and Mr. Karadic and Mr. Mladic ended up in The Hague. Um, that was only possible because the evidence was collected and the testimony was captured. Um, I, I, I th the main thing I would like to say as the last point really is um, I think there's a wide degree of agreement on what the problem is and the kinds of things we can do to tackle it. So we, we just need to get on with it. <laughs> <laughs>